A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, Section 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Miles Up the Nile by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 5 Bedrashane to Minia Part 1 It is the rule of the Nile to hurry up the river as fast as possible, leaving the ruins to be seen as the boat comes back with the current, but this, like many other canon, is by no means of universal application. The traveler who starts late in the season has, indeed, no other course open to him, he must press on with speed to the end of his journey, if he would get back again at low Nile without being irretrievably stuck on a sandbank till the next inundation floats him off again. But for those who desire not only to see the monuments, but to follow, however superficially, the course of Egyptian history as it is handed down through Egyptian art, it is above all things necessary to start early and to see many things by the way. For the history of ancient Egypt goes against the stream. The earliest monuments lie between Cairo and Siout, while the latest temples to the old gods are chiefly found in Nubia. Those travelers, therefore, who hurry blindly forward with or without a wind, now sailing, now tracking, now punting, passing this place by night and that by day, and never resting till they have gained the farthest point of their journey, begin at the wrong end and see all their sights in precisely inverse order. Memphis and Saqqara and the tombs of Beni Hassan should undoubtedly be visited on the way up. So should El Kab and Tel El Amarna and the oldest parts of Karnak and Luxor. It is not necessary to delay long at any of these places. They may be seen cursorily on the way up and be more carefully studied on the way down but they should be seen as they come, no matter at what trifling cost of present delay, and despite any amount of ignorant opposition. For in this way only is it possible to trace the progression and retrogression of the arts from the pyramid builders to the Caesars, or to understand at the time and on the spot in what order that vast and august procession of dynasties swept across the stage of history. For ourselves, as will presently be seen, it happened that we could carry only a part of this program into effect, but that part, happily, was the most important. We never ceased to congratulate ourselves on having made acquaintance with the pyramids of Giza and Saqqara before seeing the tombs of the kings at Thebes, and I feel that it is impossible to overestimate the advantage of studying the sculptures of the tomb of tea before one's taste is brought into contact with the debased style of Dendera and Esna. We began the great book, in short, as it always should be begun, at its first page, thereby acquiring just that necessary insight without which many an after chapter must have lost more than half its interest. If I seem to insist upon this point, it is because things contrary to custom need a certain amount of insistence, and are sure to be met by opposition. No dragoman, for example, could be made to understand the importance of historical sequence in a matter of this kind especially in the case of a contract trip. To him, Khufu, Ramesses, and the Ptolemies are one. As for the monuments, they are all ancient Egyptian, and one is just as old and unintelligible as another. He cannot quite understand why travelers come so far and spend so much money to look at them, but he sets it down to a habit of harmless curiosity by which he profits. The truth is, however, that the mere sightseeing of the Nile demands some little reading and organizing, if only to be enjoyed. We cannot all be profoundly learned, but we can at least do our best to understand what we see, to get rid of obstacles, to put the right thing in the right place. For the land of Egypt is, as I have said, a great book, not very easy reading, perhaps, under any circumstances, but at all events quite difficult enough already without the added puzzlement of being read backwards. And now our next point along the river, as well as our next link in the chain of early monuments, was Beni Hassan, with its famous rock-cut tombs of the Twelfth Dynasty, and Beni Hassan was still more than a hundred and forty-five miles distant. We ought to have gone on again directly, to have weighed anchor and made a few miles that very evening on returning to the boats, but we insisted on a second day in the same place. 
this too with the favorable wind still blowing. It was against all rule and precedent. The captain shook his head, the dragoman remonstrated, in vain. "'You will come to learn the value of a wind when you have been longer on the Nile,' said the latter, with that air of melancholy resignation which he always assumed when not allowed to have his own way. He was an indolent, good-tempered man, spoke English fairly well, and was perfectly manageable, but that air of resignation came to be aggravating in time. The M.B.s being of the same mind, however, we had our second day and spent it at Memphis. We ought to have crossed over to Tura, and have seen the great quarries from which the casing stones of the pyramid came, and all the finer limestone with which the temples and palaces of Memphis were built. But the whole mountainside seemed as if glowing at a white heat on the opposite side of the river, and we said we would put off Tura till our return. So we went our own way, and Alfred shot pigeons, and the writer sketched Mitrahina, and the palms, and the sacred lake of Mina, and the rest grubbed among the mounds for treasure, finding many curious fragments of glass and pottery, and part of an engraved bronze apis, and we had a green, tranquil, lovely day, barren of incident, but very pleasant to remember. The good wind continued to blow all that night but fell at sunrise, precisely when we were about to start. The river now stretched away before us, smooth as glass, and there was nothing for it, said Rais Hassan, but tracking. We had heard of tracking often enough since coming to Egypt, but without having any definite idea of the process. Coming on deck, however, before breakfast, we found nine of our poor fellows harnessed to a rope like barge horses, towing the huge boat against the current. Seven of the M.B.'s crew, similarly harnessed, followed at a few yards' distance. The two ropes met and crossed and dipped into the water together. Already our last night's mooring place was out of sight, and the pyramid of Onephus stood up amid its lesser brethren on the edge of the desert, as if bidding us good-bye. But the sight of the trackers jarred, somehow, with the placid beauty of the picture. We got used to it, as one gets used to everything in time, but it looked like slaves' work and shocked our English notions disagreeably. That morning, still tracking, we passed the pyramids of Dashur. A dilapidated brick pyramid standing in the midst of them looks like an anguille of black rock thrusting itself up through the limestone bed of the desert. Palms line the bank and intercept the view, but we catch flitting glimpses here and there, looking out especially for that dome-like pyramid which we observed the other day from Saqqara. Seen in the full sunlight, it looks larger and whiter, and more than ever like the roof of the old Palais de Justice far away in Paris. Thus the morning passes. We sit on deck, writing letters, reading, watching the sunny riverside pictures that glide by at a foot's pace and are so long in sight palm groves, sandbanks, patches of fuzzy-headed durrell, and fields of some yellow flowering herb succeed each other. A boy plods along the bank, leading a camel. They go slowly, but they soon leave us behind. A native boat meets us, floating down sideways with the current. A girl comes to the water's edge with a great empty jar on her head, and waits to fill it till the trackers have gone by. The pigeon towers of a mud village peep above a clump of lebbek trees a quarter of a mile inland. Here a solitary brown man, with only a felt skull cap on his head and a slip of scanty tunic fastened about his loins, works a shadoof, stooping and rising, stooping and rising, with the regularity of a pendulum. It is the same machine which we shall see by and by depicted in the tombs at Thebes and the man is so evidently an ancient Egyptian that we find ourselves wondering how he escaped being mummified four or five thousand years ago. By and by a little breeze springs up. The men drop the rope and jump on board. The big sail is set, the breeze freshens, and away we go again as merrily as the day we left Cairo. Towards sunset we see a strange object, like a giant obelisk broken off halfway, standing up on the western bank against an orange-gold sky. This is the Pyramid of Medum, commonly called the False Pyramid. It looks quite near the bank, but this is an effect of powerful light and shadow, for it lies back at least four miles from the river. 
That night, having sailed on till past nine o'clock, we moor about a mile from Beni Suef, and learn with some surprise that a man must be dispatched to the governor of the town for guards. Not that anything ever happened to anybody at Beni Suef, says Ptolemy, but that the place is supposed not to have a first-rate reputation. If we have guards, we at all events make the governor responsible for our safety and the safety of our possessions. So the guards are sent for, and being posted on the bank, snore loudly all night long just outside our windows. Meanwhile the wind shifts round to the south, and next morning it blows full in our faces. The men, however, track up to Beni Suef to a point where the buildings come down to the water's edge and the towing path ceases, and there we lay to for a while among a fleet of filthy native boats close to the landing place. The approach to Beni Suef is rather pretty. The Khedive has an Italian-looking villa here, which peeps up white and dazzling from the midst of a thickly wooded park. The town lies back a little from the river. A few coffee houses and a kind of promenade face the landing place, and a mosque built to the verge of the bank stands out picturesquely against the bend of the river. And now it is our object to turn that corner so as to get into a better position for starting when the wind drops. The current here runs deep and strong, so that we have both wind and water dead against us. Half our men clamber round the corner like cats, carrying the rope with them. The rest keep the dahabiyah off the bank with punting poles. The rope strains, a pole breaks, we struggle forward a few feet and can get no farther. Then the men rest a while, try again, and are again defeated. So the fight goes on. The promenade and the windows of the mosque become gradually crowded with lookers-on. Some three or four cloaked and bearded men have chairs brought, and sit gravely smoking their chibouks on the bank above, enjoying the entertainment. Meanwhile, the water carriers come and go, filling their goat skins at the landing place. Donkeys and camels are brought down to drink. Girls in dark blue gowns and coarse black veils come with huge water jars laid sideways upon their heads, and having filled and replaced them upright, walk away with stately steps, as if each ponderous vessel were a crown. So the day passes. Driven back again and again, but still resolute, our sailors, by dint of sheer doggedness, get us round the bad corner at last. The bagstones follow suit a little later, and we both moor about a quarter of a mile above the town. Then follows a night of adventures. Again our guards sleep profoundly, but the bad characters of Beni Suef are very wide awake. One gentleman, actuated no doubt by the friendliest motives, pays a midnight visit to the Bagstones, but being detected, chased, and fired at, escapes by jumping overboard. Our turn comes about two hours later, when the rider, happening to be awake, hears a man swim softly round the filet. To strike a light and frighten everybody into sudden activity is the work of a moment. The whole boat is instantly in an uproar. Lanterns are lighted on deck. A patrol of sailors is set. Ptolemy loads his gun, and the thief slips away in the dark like a fish. The guards, of course, slept sweetly through it all. Honest fellows. They were paid a shilling a night to do it, and they had nothing on their minds. Having lodged a formal complaint next morning against the inhabitants of the town, we received a visit from a sallow personage clad in a long black robe and a voluminous white turban. This was the chief of the guards. He smoked a great many pipes, drank numerous cups of coffee, listened to all we had to say, looked wise, and finally suggested that the number of our guards should be doubled. End of section 13